What's up? Joe 508. Okay, as promised, today's lecture. Um, it's July 4th, right? 2022. So, you know, be safe and be sane, all right? Um, we all want to get together and we all want to go crazy. Uh, we're in a world of hurt right now. Uh, the I, I could teach an entire class on immunology and virology. Um, sadly, um, the coronavirus, okay, SARS-CoV-2, has had this evolution, all right, where it's mutated. And we all thought we were good with the BA1 and 2. And yeah, you know what? It was mostly an upper respiratory, kind of a sinus, you know, sore throat, stopped about right here general kind of flu feeling, and uh, some partial protection from the spike protein vaccine that we got from Pfizer or Moderna. I'm sing-songing here. But the reality is it's evolving. And the next wave that's slamming Portugal right now and is moving across Europe and now entering the United States is the new variant, the 4 and the 5 version of the Omicron variant. And uh, it's R0, which is how infectious it is. So going for a typical flu with a person who had an R0 of two, one person might infect two people, to an Omicron R0 of six or seven, and now the BA2 of an eight or nine. And uh, the other sad thing is it's no longer up here, sinuses and sore throat, it's moving back down into the lungs producing a lot more disease, okay? More morbidity, more death, everything. So we're going to have to be careful. Hopefully science will protect us. <laughs> That's all I can say. There are some good drugs out there um, that uh, that are coming, but it's it, this is the long haul. So anyways, all right, cool. So uh, let's get into a, a discussion of what's going on. Wear your masks. I'm, I can, if you're going to get on an airplane, airplanes are lethal right now. So um, we're going to get into uh, the... The second lecture for the second week, so it'll be the fourth assignment or the fourth lecture today, and it's going to be looking at the um, the health consequences of stress and health consequences of elevated cortisol. All right, awesome. Um, I'm wearing my USC T-shirt, as you can see. It's also the USC band. All right, so my son was in the marching band for the first couple of years. The pandemic hit, and he decided to just focus on studies. All right. All right, let's get right into it. Again, keep your eyes on the prize with this. Keep thinking about it. Email us if you have any questions about that. All right. Um, we can also provide our cell phone numbers. Mine's 949-292-5198. Julia's is 5199. And you can call us anytime or text us. All righty. So we're going to go down here. We've done one, two, three, and four. Okay. Um, so we talked about... Um, the global aspects of stress on the body, we're gonna get into the brain here, all right? Some of the consequences of damaging the brain as a result of high levels of chronic stress, okay? All right, well, let's check this out. So this lecture is gonna go right in here, okay? So um, we can see, you know, what's gonna elevate our stress hormones, okay? So we talked about the amygdala. When it fires too hard, it then activates the um, hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then activates, um, uh, releases hormones that go into the pituitary gland, and then the pituitary gland releases hormones that act on the adrenal gland. That's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That gets activated because of anxiety, depression, okay? Stress. All right, all right. And then we're going to continue to make this link, okay, when you have high levels of stress hormones, it reduces the ability of insulin receptors to do their job. Blood glucose levels get sky high, okay? And um, those two things, okay, those two factors then become permissive for brain disease, all right? Uh, if we lose our prefrontal cortex because of elevated cortisol, okay, that is a problem. An underactive prefrontal cortex is what happens in clinical depression. When we give antidepressant drugs, we're just trying to boost the activity of the prefrontal cortex so that it can orchestrate more of its kind of um, CEO action, the executive, okay, 
on all the different parts of our brain and how they work, right? That's what the uh, the prefrontal cortex is. It's your CEO. It's the decision maker, okay? It's the executive. And um, so that's what, you know, traditional um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Trintelex, okay? Like Zoloft, that's what they do. They increase the activity of the prefrontal cortex. Um, newer approaches to increase the prefrontal cortex activity is to use transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS and the magnetic waves cause the prefrontal cortex to fire and when it fires then it grows. Okay, back to stress, all right? Stress causes shrinking of the prefrontal cortex, all right? Um, that leads to clinical depression. Stress causes shrinking of the, of the hippocampus that leads to memory impairment, all right? And the combination of both of those shrinking is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, okay? And we can, we'll can see how not just the direct action of, of the stress hormones, but it's the, the fact that stress hormones cause your insulin system not to work correctly. So that insulin no longer acts to do its job. Brain cells don't get the glucose that they need. Um, they begin uh, to go into a pathological state of generating free radicals that cause damage, and the cells begin to die off. Okay. <clears throat> also, I'm going to I'm going to go over the fact that we have an issue with high blood glucose that leads to candy coating of proteins that causes inflammation. Right. So starving the brain basically of glucose. Inflammation starves the brain of glucose and oxygen cells begin to die off, all right? So that's kind of this take-home concept, all right? So we can see here, we're gonna look at this. This is the a, 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 a key points that are taken from this paper right here. But again, the best way to go about this, I always forget to tell you this, but just do open your quiz in a separate browser, okay? And then you can just kind of peck away at it as you're going through. This um, is about a project looking at the link between Alzheimer's disease and Diabetes, and I'm going to go over that, okay? Remember, stress can cause diabetes. Stress exacerbates diabetes. It makes things worse, okay? Because it ruins the function of insulin receptors and it elevates blood glucose, okay? All righty. So, um, again, the key points from this paper um, about anxiety and damaging the brain. So, we looked at damage of the body last time, okay? We look at the brain now is that... Um, uh, pathological anxiety and the associated chronic stress increases the risk of a lot of neuropsychiatric disorders, okay? Depression and dementia, the two that are focused in on, okay? Like I said, okay, an overactive stress response reflects an overactive amygdala, okay? This is the anger, fear, rage center, okay? And this then uh, leads to deficits because now you're going to be pumping out cortisol and that's going to impair the function of our memory center. And that's the hippocampus right here. We have some neurons that are produced continually, okay? Just like we have new blood cells, new skin cells, we have some neurons, not many, produced in the hippocampus to keep memory going. And for the ones that are there, the branching out um, is uh, is an important part of plasticity that stress can reduce, okay? All right, so again, these stress-induced changes contribute to development of affective disorders. What are the affective disorders? Clinical depression, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, okay? And cognitive disorders, okay? So you can have benign senescent forgetfulness, okay, like I'm starting to get, or you can have more significant cognitive disorders associated with different forms of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common, okay? And there's plenty of evidence that, like I said, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, okay, can be restored, okay, if you take proper medication to reduce your anxiety and to reduce your de depression, okay? The other alternative that we're going to really push in this class is remember nature and nurture okay so nature is the genetics okay but nurture we can change the environment all right we can um, learn how to react to stressors through what's called cognitive behavioral therapy all right and uh, it, when you learn to control how you react to stressors then your overall physiology can be better because you can have less cortisol 
less likelihood of um, degeneration in the brain, but less likelihood of, um, of diabetes as well, okay? So that's what that's all about right here. And, I, and again, um, what we do, okay, is we provide you th this real nice review of what is going on in the paper, okay? So you can, you can um, go through this and look at this, how this reflects back to the paper. That way you can just kind of take an easy read on the paper, all right? And then we do the same thing right here. In this particular case, okay, we're looking at, I want you to connect the dots, okay? And that's what this video is all about right here, of elevated stress hormones, which means high levels of cortisol, okay? Insulin receptor insensitivity, all right? So this alters the functioning of insulin receptors, so you're no longer to, able to get glucose into cells, muscle cells, kidney cells, and in terms of this section, your brain, all right? And um, and so we're going to make this connection then between stress and diabetes, okay, which is what I'm talking about there. We have stress-related diabetes, okay? And then we look at diabetes being a big issue in terms of Alzheimer's that I'm going to go back to later on, all right? So that's what this is all about right here. And again, people that study um, dementia, they call Alzheimer's disease, all right? What do we call it? We call it type 3 diabetes, Okay. Type 1 being juvenile onset because of the autoimmune attack of your pancreas. Type 2 having a, to be an interaction between the environment, how you live your life, are you stressed out, do you eat really you know, kind of crappy, high sugar foods, and your genetics. Okay, that's the nature part, the nurture part, what I was talking about a second ago. Right? So let's take a look at this paper right here. Okay? And, uh, boom. All right, can anxiety damage the brain, okay? All right, and the answer is yes, it can, all right? So um, it goes through, again, uh, the key players that I was talking about, all right? These guys right here, all right, the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, okay? What they do is they control the amygdala, okay? If these guys shrink, you lose control of the amygdala, and that's kind of what they're going about right here. And the fact that... Um, Yes, cognitive behavioral therapy is the number one thing you can do, but you can also use pharmacological tools that are at the fingertips of psychiatrists, okay? For example, antidepressant medications like I was talking about, okay? Zoloft, okay? Prozac, Trintelix uses selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitors, and what they then do is they increase the activity of the prefrontal cortex, which will then help shut down the amygdala, okay? All righty, but don't forget, you need to put in the work and the time. Cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise. So I exercise every single day, okay, as best I can. My cognitive behavioral therapy is to get into the ocean as often as I can, all right? And it allows me to lose myself in nature and rid myself of a lot of the anxieties that I might be having about uh, what's going on with my work life, my kids, and all that kind of stuff, okay? All righty. So um, key, key elements is a combination of the two, all right? So here's the summary right here. And again, it's just, you know, it's exactly what I was talking about. All righty. Another key element that I didn't bring up last time about cognitive behavioral therapy is you surround yourself with really good supportive people like my wife, Julia, okay? And um, that causes an elevation of oxytocin and oxytocin increases dopamine. And both of those actions will reduce the activity of your stress response as well, right? So this is why you surround yourself with supportive people, but you also need to get rid of people that make you stressed out, okay? It's important to kind of regulate who you're going to hang with, okay? What are the triggers for problems, okay? And it, it is important to, if people are not supportive, you need to kind of eliminate them from your daily routines, all right? All right, so this goes through, you know, what what anxiety feels like, okay? You know, this would be, uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge state of arousal, but, it, you know, uh, you know, the sweating, trembling, dizziness, heartbeat, you know, um, um, some of us have had a panic attack. I did once when I lost all my funding, you know? And I actually had trouble breathing the whole nine yards, okay? And uh, um, and then some people uh, go through life having these little miniature panic attacks, okay? And that's called an anxiety disorder. All right. So um, this goes through, you know, all the different uh, connections to stress. And then, again, chronic elevation of stress hormones. Um, 
is a pathological state, okay? And um, as they say right here, it wreaks havoc on all of your physiological systems. We learned that from the last lecture, immune suppression, okay? Metabolic meaning, okay, I'm gonna become a diabetic. Cardiovascular, you have diabetic-related atherosclerosis, okay? Um, and then when your vascular system's not working, when you have diabetes, then that is a, uh, precipitates a lot of other pathologies, okay? Eye diseases of aging, kidney disease as we get older, um, and, uh, um, and a risk for all the brain diseases of aging like stroke and, and, uh, and, and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, okay? All righty. So, again, this is just kind of a map that shows everything. This is the, the, uh, the key points that I talked about, that I, I brought up in the last, uh, um, uh, before I entered the article, all right? And um, as we look in here, you see it's color-coded for what it does. We see, we, we see green, we see yellow, and we see red. And it just shows you this kind of interaction right here between prefrontal cortex and the amygdala down here. The hippocampus is right here, okay? And they just show you the interplay that happens in terms of um, uh, emotional memories and, and, uh, and also in terms of emotional regulation. And it's just, you know, all these things come together. And that's, you just kind of read through that and you'll figure this out, okay? So again, this, go, this shows you the circuitry of fear and anxiety, okay? Again, the key element, we, we have uh, incoming, this is incoming, you know, sensory input. So you hear something, you smell something, okay? Um, and it, what it does is it reactivates, those sensory inputs reactivates the old memories that caused you harm maybe, okay? So you generate this fear response immediately, okay? And that's what they're talking about right here, okay? All right, and then uh, that interacts with the hippocampus, and then what happens is it causes a trigger to activate the amygdala, okay? Which is the expression of fear. The A in amygdala, okay, is like the A in fear, okay? A in anger, okay? A in rage, okay? So that's the kind of way you look at it. And so they talk about this kind of, the interaction of these different processes. They're focusing in here in this first part on um, the, uh, the different components of the frontal cortex, okay? Um, it's beyond, you know, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is the emotional core in terms of our emotional executive deciding what we're gonna do. And then we, we look back here on the hippocampus and that is about bringing up the memory of those old L days, those old elements that caused you harm, okay? And then the hippocampus works with the prefrontal cortex, that's called your working memory, where you're taking in the incoming information, you're looking at what happened before, and your executive, the frontal cortex then, is deciding, what are we gonna do, okay? Are we gonna go to the amygdala and say, you know what? Slow your roll, okay? That's what cognitive behavioral therapy allows you to do, right? It allows you to, you know what? It wasn't so bad last time when I did X, Y, and Z, things got better, okay? Or if it has a straight shot, you think about this bad memory, the decision making goes straight to the amygdala, boom, it just balloons into a full blown panic attack, social anxiety, whatever it is, okay? All right, so that's what that's all about. They go over the circuitry of the stress response. We've talked about this already, okay? The hypothalamic, okay? Pituitary adrenal axis, right? So. That's where the amygdala activates this kind of air traffic controller of our brain, the hypothalamus, that then brings into action all of our body, all right? So this is the mind-to-body connection, okay? I like to throw it out there. And, and so they go over a lot more details in here than you need to know, but, but just read through it and kind of appreciate it, all right? Um, and then they go over the, um, the act of pathology, what happens, and, and the damage that is gonna happen, okay? It's kind of wear and tear from stress hormones, okay? And so they talk about the lots and lots of different disorders. You see PTSD right here, okay, anxiety. That leads to an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, for cognitive impairment, okay? So all of these, have, this is called epidemiology. So studies where we do correlations, we look at people that have, through years and years, have, have indicated they have had these problems, okay? These affective problems, depression, PTSD, anxiety, okay? Um, and they're seeing uh, elements of dementia, and that's what that's all about. And then when you can go in there, 
and we can do in humans we can do an mri and we can look at shrinking of the prefrontal cortex shrinking of the hippocampus okay we can do uh match this with the same kind of studies in animal models okay and then in here this part they looked at the effect of treating the anxiety okay and treating the chemistry I and mean, they talk about the different types of drugs okay so Propronolol is one drug that that it is oftentimes prescribed. It blocks adrenergic receptors. Okay, um, antidepressants. Okay, are going to change the circuitry. Okay, so you can go after um, the adrenaline that gets released in the brain. We can also go in and augment the circuitry of the uh, prefrontal cortex using um, uh, the traditional antidepressant drugs. All right. Okay, guys, so that's what that's all about right there. And I'd just like to kind of give you guys a, you know, a straight-up overview of going on here, what we're, what's going on. Okay, so, again, this is a nice tour, this video. The video is about 20 minutes where they, they talk about the research that's ongoing, connecting diabetes to Alzheimer's. And what I've tried to do, I've, I, I've tried to connect, connect stress, okay, from okay the affective disorders so from clinical depression from ptsd and even from anxiety the stress response that gets elevated and now how that causes diabetes you have now have diabetes and that could be a connection right here to alzheimer's all right so you can see we look right in here okay and uh again what we're looking at here in this one is the diabetes link to Alzheimer's disease, okay? Again, so this is a review article, and uh, so in this, in my particular case, I'm gonna have to use the, the hand, okay? And it, and, it, and it talks about the linkage between um, type one, type two diabetes, what it's all about, degeneration, okay? And um, how we see in diabetes, these characteristics of neuropathology. And this, what this is right here, where we have nerve cell loss, loss of synapses, and then the accumulation of these pathologic molecules called tau, hyperphosphatidyl tau, and beta amyloid. And this, the, the beta amyloid and tau have been the target of, of um, drug development for years. Okay. All right. So, what do we see here? Okay. Obstacle disease and brain glucose starvation. Why would that happen? Okay. In order for the glucose to get into any cell in your body, that glucose has to bind to, what well, I mean tunnel through sorry a transporter okay that transporter is not in the membrane of any cell until insulin binds to an insulin receptor when insulin binds the receptor it's like a key opening a lock and then this channel okay um which is a transporter would then vacuum cleaner the glucose out of your blood and into the cell then the cell does its job if i'm a nurse cell then i grow and i do all kinds of crazy stuff that make me a badass nerve cell, okay? If I don't have functioning insulin receptors because of why? High cortisol, high inflammatory cytokines, okay? Remember the obesity, okay? Where it's inflammatory. And then remember the obesity where you have high levels of free fatty acids. All of these reduce the functioning of insulin receptors and the ability to pump glucose into the cell. No glucose into brain cells and you basically you functionally starve them okay all right and then when you starve them okay you get this abnormal generation of free radicals and in combination then you start to see the accumulation of um, these pathological molecules and that's what they're going to talk about right here so it's a combination okay of lack of nutrients getting into brain cells and then also um, what happens is we see this evidence for um, when high glucose is in the blood, it creates a pathological activation of the immune system. Okay? These are called advanced glycation end products, and I'm going to show you a figure about that in a little while. Okay? All right, so here's some more evidence of this. We call it type 3 diabetes. This is a really end stage of diabetes, and we see this deficiency in insulin and IGF-1. This is another hormone that gets released, okay? Um, when we have nutrition, but what happens is um, the uh, the elevation of stress hormones, cortisol, the elevation of cytokines from inflammation, okay, and increased levels of fat in the blood cause impairment of these receptors, and you don't get brain cell growth, okay? So that's what that's all about. So they're looking at 
that right here in this section. This is an overview of how these guys work. Okay, so how insulin and IGF-1 work. And then this is the evidence right here that things have gone awry or gone south because of diabetes. Okay. Alrighty. And then um, when they're not working and nerve cells are not getting the nutrition that they need, okay, then you start getting free radical generation. And then this, in addition, causes inflammation. Okay. All right. It also precipitates the formation of these pathological molecules that are seen in the brains of people that suffer from dementia. Okay. And they talk about this right there as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, and they then link it back to, to neurodegeneration. All right. So that's, you know, again, that's an overview. So when you go ahead and read through it, you know, again, it's a little thick. Okay. But you're going to find it, it will all make sense. Now, one thing I, I wanted to do again, so, so again, we're connecting it between stress, elevated cortisol, okay, diabetes, okay. What happens too is um, the inflammation, I'll never, never forget, um, my wife told me this, you know, I, I'm sad because I eat and I eat because I'm sad. If you're all stressed out, you start um, eating abnormally, your diet changes, okay. And, um, and it can lend itself to obesity. So we've seen that stress, is linked to obesity and the obesity then links to diabetes okay all right so we're making that connection stress obesity diabetes stress insulin resistance okay high levels of blood glucose okay and we start you know looking at all this um and we see um kind of a shocking bit of information when we're going from the mind to the body okay so this is you know our anxiety clinical depression or PTSD, dumping cortisol during the stress response. Also, lots of adrenaline that increases our blood pressure, okay? And um, then uh, we see uh, the development of diabetes, okay? And then we look, when we go back, now we're, so we're from mind to body, now we're gonna go from body back up to mind, okay? So the diabetes causes inflammation the diabetes causes the brain not able to transport glucose into or amino acids into nerve cells. So they can't rebuild and do their thing. And so what we see is you're not able to repair damage and the damage then takes control. And we see this right here, 80% of people, 80%, 8-0 of people with Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease have insulin resistance, okay? So they could be pre-diabetic with this or full-blown type 2 diabetes, okay? And this is why uh, Alzheimer's is now being referred to as a type 3 diabetes, okay? Um, this is a, another a paper I, I brought up. I was just hunting around. Again, insulin resistance exacerbates Alzheimer's disease, and there's lots of mechanisms. Um, I want to show, throw a little biology. It's a pretty, you know, this is a paper that you can look up on your own if you wish. You can see the title right here, okay? It's in Frontiers in neuroscience, okay, 2021 paper. And I just wanted to come down here to this figure, okay, because in this figure, okay, we're looking at this concept of insulin resistance. And a couple of things I've talked about, okay, when glucose gets really, really elevated because of your diabetic situation, because you have insulin resistance, your type two diabetes, then this glucose will then candy coat all the different proteins on the surface of the cells and all the proteins that float around in your bloodstream that perform lots and lots of different jobs, okay? These proteins then are uh, what's called, they have with the, with the candy coating, they're called advanced glycation end product, okay? So that advanced glycation end product binds to a receptor that exists on cells throughout all your body, your immune system cells, the cells that line your vasculature, okay? And what they do is they activate this pathway that is a major inflammatory pathway that releases all of these inflammatory cytokines, okay? You've heard, you've heard of TNF-alpha? TNF you know why you've heard that? Because that's the target of Humira, okay? For people that have lots and lots of autoimmune diseases where there's too much inflammation, okay? Um, you've probably heard of interleukin-6. That's another drug that is used to treat autoimmune disease, it's called Actemra, okay? All righty. So all these inflammatory cytokines can increase the load of this pathology that results in Alzheimer's disease. We see this right here, okay? Um, 
The other thing that the inflammatory cytokines do, see that's a negative sign, they block the ability to get rid of the accumulated beta amyloid, okay? This together, okay, causes real problems in terms of tau phosphorylation. So that's kind of connecting all the dots and it just, insulin resistance then begets further insulin receptor um, resistance, okay? So now you have fewer receptors than ones you have don't work and it becomes this downward spiral, all right? So that's what that's all about right there, okay? Very cool, very cool, very cool, very cool. Let's go back to uh, the paper that we were looking at here, all right? Right there, okay. All right, so um, um, that connects all the dots, okay, uh, with uh, the, the the linkages that I was making to um, diabetes, okay? And then the previous paper, what I wanted to do is I wanted to connect all the dots. I'm linking diabetes to mental health problems, anxiety, depression, et cetera. And then we went back and we connected it back to Alzheimer's disease, and that was really the kind of focus of the um this week's chapter okay or this week's assignment right all righty so answer the questions okay and then we're going to look at um the changes that we have there and so when i say changes in circuitry remember we have these two areas okay that help control our stress response that shrink all right so that's the loss of the prefrontal cortex and loss of the hippocampus so that that we need to have bigger and more badass to control the amygdala okay all right, think about that. Think about um, when it goes awry, how diabetes happens, and then how that puts you at risk for Alzheimer's disease. All right, guys, very cool. So that's the extent of what's going on this week. Please contact me if you have any problems, and have a great 4th of July. Fight on.